This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. On the show today, you'll find out where book publishing is going and how to take advantage of it. How to identify and avoid publishing predators. What opportunities are emerging as the book trade evolves in new forms. How to avoid losing money and much, much more. Join us now as a variety of publishing pros will deliver insights and strategies to take the author to the next, next level of publishing. It's your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Brought to you by Author You and The Book Shepherd. And now, here's your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode for Your Author Success with the Author You, Your Guide to Book Publishing show. Within it, you're going to get a variety of ahas, insights, tips, and how for your author and publishing and book marketing success. I guarantee it. With me today is someone who has not graced our airways yet, but I certainly do want him back again. Donald Kelly helps sales professionals and entrepreneurs find more prospects, build stronger value, and close more deals. That means, folks, sell more books. In addition to all the training sales professionals in the workshops and online courses and keynote presentations he does, Donald is also the host of the popular sales podcast called The Sales Evangelist. With listeners in over 155 countries and over 2.6 million all-time downloads, he's received recognition from publications such as Entrepreneur Magazine, Inc., Forbes, HubSpot, The HuffPost, and the South Florida Business Journal. His mission is to evangelize the method of effective selling and motivate sellers of all levels to do big things. So, Donald, welcome the sales evangelist to the Author You, Your Guide to Book Publishing podcast. So, are we ready to jump into this? Oh, yes, we are. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for having me and for uh, just giving that wonderful introduction. I appreciate it so much and I'm looking forward to sharing some tips that can help some of these authors improve. You are so welcome. You know, I was looking over your website, and um, I actually, as soon as I saw the colors, oh, we have a little Caribbean here. So you're from Jamaica? <laughs> <laughs> you're from Jamaica originally, or you yeah. grew up there, or where? Okay. And yeah, that's originally where you... I moved. Yeah? Yeah, I moved to the U.S. when I was a nine-year-old, a nine, nine years old as a kid. All right, so you were you a master kid salesperson? <laughs> I was one of those guys. Yes, I was the uh, the kid. We used to get mangoes or uh, and sell them in the front yard, and then uh-huh. uh, at least try to, and then mm-hmm. uh, get cookies, put them in bags, and try to sell them. That I was one of those one of those kids always trying to figure out a way. I just saw that it, it you know folks in my community and that's what a lot of people did. They were entrepreneurs. They were hustling. So I figured, hey, if that's how you make money, I want to make some money. Let's do it. So <laughs> I well, became a quote unquote business mind. You know, I love. I actually love it that you use the word hustle because it. This is a hustle. You know yeah. that it's so many people just think that everyone. Oh, I call it the school teacher mentality. And although I love school teachers and I taught too, but that surely everyone will notice what a great job I do with the children. And so mm-hmm. therefore I don't have to brag. I don't have to remind them. I don't have to reinforce that. Yes, you do. So there, it is a form of a hustle, um, yeah. going on. Yeah. I learned how to hustle on the beach and where on you, the beach. please tell me uh, more. I hustled on the beach. As a eight-year-old, I found a wagon, a little red flyer wagon, and I would watch people, usually teens and adults, drinking uh, soda pops or beer, beer bottles. Um, and I would watch them until they got that last drop, and then I would approach them and ask them if if they would like me to take their bottle to return it so they wouldn't have to return it. And so... You know, it was two cents at a time, Donald, two cents at a time. Wow. But And and the beer bottles were nickel. They were nickel. 
But I in bottles, wagons of bottles. And that was my movie money <laughs> for the week. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to do it, you know, you, because some people will probably just sit back and wait for their allowance or wait for the parents to give them something. But, you know, sometimes people who want to go out and get something, they, they just get up and go make it happen. And I'm, I'm a firm oh. believer in that. Like, you cannot wait. You can't just – if you sit back and wait, opportunities will pass you by. And uh, there are actors, people who get up and act, and people who are acted upon. And I don't like to be acted upon. I like to be in charge and to make things happen. Well, that um, I look at. No one was going to notice a little girl holding on to a wagon, salivating as they drank their soda because she couldn't afford it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and allowances? You gotta be kidding! All right, so let's jump into this. How does we've got a we've got a, an hour that's going to go very fast? How? Oh yeah. Does an author, because here's the problem with a lot of authors and certainly writers. I, I just want to write. I don't want to market. I, I, with sales. Oh my God. I'm not a salesperson. Um, how do we get them over that hump? How do we yeah. get them over the hump that they want to embrace being a sales evangelist? How do we do that? Well, the first thing is I feel that, uh, you are, if you look at the writers, um, all writers throughout the history, those individuals had to become salespeople in order to get their work out. Look at Shakespeare. How did Shakespeare get his work out? Well, through theater, right? He had performances. He had presentations. When people came to that, then that's when they saw it and they were, you know, they got a chance to, to learn more about it. Then later on, his, his work became more, you know, his literature became more popular. He used a means of getting, it's just kind of like getting a blog or something to that nature to put the message out there. People fall in love with the stuff, and now they're reading Hamlet all over the place, or now they're reading uh, Romeo and Juliet all over the place. If you look at the Bible, if you look at some of the, the authors from that time period, such as like, you know, Paul, it, it, he wrote stuff, but then later on he went in proper, he went in and, and, and brought this to other people. And I think if you look at it throughout any, any all, all the way back to antiquity, all the famous authors had ways of getting their messages out there. So fast forward, all of them were evangelists, and I'm not talking about in a religious term. All of them were evangelists in the sense that these people had something of worth, and they wanted others to get that information. Yes, creating a book is fantastic, and that is an awesome accomplishment. I feel that's one of the – it's a way that you can leave a legacy. It's a way that you can uh, you know, put in print and, and, and get to more people. Creating a book alone is just is half the battle, or maybe not even half. Maybe it's a quarter of the battle. The, the key part there is now that you've done this, how do you get it out there? I've learned a statement, and I've followed this, and I've taught this to my clients, and I've taught this to people who are trying to be their own, quote-unquote, evangelist, is that nobody knows what you have to offer until they know what you have to offer. Nobody knows what you have to offer until they know what they, you have to offer. So you might say, well, I have a book. I have a website. People should know my stuff. No, they don't know that. I remember even recently, one of my clients, a top client, he went, he I was talking to him about, well, he was new at the time. So, uh, um, he had gone through one of our programs, but I thought he had did as well betting. I thought I explained to him about my stuff. But anyways, we had a conversation like uh, two months later after he went through one of our programs. And he was like, oh, man, I didn't know you offer that service in a conversation. I'm like, serious? It's on the website. <laughs> and I thought, I assumed. Whoa. I assumed, Judith. And you can never, ever assume. So the idea here is people don't know what you have to offer to you have to offer. So every author needs to be an evangelist, and they need to discover a method or a vehicle whereabout they get the information out. And that's why you see a lot of authors are obviously, you know, this the speaker circuit, or they go on different yeah. podcasts, and we'll talk about this and some of those other sales strategies later on. Oh, I love actually, I love the line. I actually wrote, I wrote it down. No one knows what you have to offer until you offer it. That is so crucial. And I also love the whole idea of Shakespeare being a hustler. I think that's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> but but that is so true. You know, that you, another word in is hustling, we, we talk about hawking, hawking our wares. But that, mm -hmm. that it's really getting out there and letting people know that you have them so they can – process it however they process it to decide hmm is this something i have an interest in ah but that's where the sales techniques come in right 
Donald? Am I yes. right? Or? Okay. So yes. let's talk about let's, let's talk about that. So what are some of those strategies that we can get into that we could use? Um, that would get them in. We, I know we have about a couple of minutes to our first break, but sure. let's see if we can kiss some and we're going to keep coming back to them because I think the whole thing, sales strategies are the lures, the hooks, so you can reel them in. Yeah. The biggest thing is that you need to point out problems. Like any good author, you're able to, you're writing your book because you saw there was a, an, an, a gap uh, or a, a challenge that people had in the, in the, in the universe or in their life, mm -hmm. and then you're writing a book to fill that void, whether that's for entertainment or whether that's to educate them. When it comes towards us, the first sales strategy that everyone needs to understand is as an author, you need to make sure people don't people don't love people love to buy, but they hate to be sold. And I, that's not my term. I can't take that. I got it from Jeffrey Gittimer, and I think he got it from like um, one of the the sales legends. But the, the idea people love to buy, but they hate to be sold. And the reason why people love to buy, they love to buy things that are solving problems for them. So in the first sales strategy, every author needs to understand what problem or what pain they are solving with their book. What problem, what pain you're solving for your, with your book. That now you utilize it in your messaging. We're going to talk about some of, you know, that, that, like how you pitch yourself. But you, you, that's the first thing you need to understand. So for instance, if I'm, if I'm a, a great cook, uh, a cook and I want to get my message out there even more so, then I might write my, my book on how to, you know, 15 minute uh, dinner recipes or whatever. And I, I might find that, you know, the biggest problem is that millennials and, or, you know, individuals, uh, they're, they don't have a lot of time to cook food anymore. So we have these small, uh, quick, simple, easy recipes and that's the pain that I'm solving. So that's the very first thing. And as far as a strategy is concerned, that's okay, so hold that. All right, hold the Sorry. strategy with that. We're going to take a quick break. Um, we'll be right back in a couple of minutes. With me is the fabulous Donald Kelly, the sales evangelist. <laughs> This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Is there a book in you? Or another? Author You shows you how to create, develop, and publish your book without being hoodwinked. If you already have a book out, you will find a supportive and brainstorming community that is connected and creative no matter where you live. Author U brings in national experts for its book camps and annual Author U extravaganza. It has regular meetings and delivers webinars for its members on timely topics. Through Author U's extensive network, members enjoy exclusive benefits, including significant discounts for a variety of services necessary to publishing. Author U is the premier authoring resource in the country, creating community, education, guidance, vision, and success for the serious author. If you want to create a book that has pizzazz, punch, and panache, Author U is for you. Timely author and publishing tips and articles are posted on its social media platforms, and it is free. Discover Author U, where authors go to become seriously successful. Join Author U today at AuthorU.org. Are you confused about publishing options? Do you know which printing option is best for your book? Does your stomach flip when you think about selling books? Or do you feel overwhelmed with what to do about book marketing and publicity? Get the answers and much more. Get them and from someone who knows publishing inside and out from both the traditional and independent sides how to make a successful book. You can't do it alone without paying the price. You can spend your money creating a book that turns out to be so-so. Or you can create a book that looks and feels classy, builds your brand and platform, and is a success, a bestseller. It is your choice. You choose. If you want author and publishing success, you want Judith Bryles as your book coach. Sign up for her weekly blogs and e-zine at thebookshepherd.com.
Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All righty, this show is not for whiners. This show is for doers today. And with us is Donald Kelly. He's known as the Sales Evangelist. And his website, for all of you to check it out, is the salesevangelist.com but we're really talking about getting into the whole strategy of how do you morph from shy author writer or I can't really do it to really embracing the fact that you know you're in sales you've got a product your book's a product you got a P&L which means you've got expenses we need to get some profits in to offset them um, and go through it so Donald was just starting on uh, before a break on identifying the sales strategy based on usually you start with what the pain and the problem is of the person who you are attempting to buy who hate to be sold to. All right, back to you, Donald. <laughs> yes, thanks. So if we look at it with all of our prospects or how we're going to try to morph this thing and, 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 and actually get it into the hands of individuals and get them excited to buy it. Yeah, go back to the idea. Look at the pain and look at how we can solve a pain for that individual. And if, with the cookbook example, like I was giving again, is more PSA, for instance, where we have individuals who are trying to, you know, cook at home and they want to be able to have that uh, that delicious meal and don't want to have the time, position your message towards that. Uh, specifically, though, is for you as a book coach, I mean, a, I mean, a book writer, there's several things that you can take advantage of. And I think this is where a lot of authors fall short. Right, Judith, is that they look and they try to sell to individual rather than selling to a many. So if your book is not a fiction book, but it's something that can benefit in the, in, in the business world, my suggestion is that you look for ways to sell to corporations your book. Become Shakespeare at that point. Make sure you create a little speech or a little message or a little training around the idea. Maybe it's how you can have more effective meetings or how you can have, uh, you know, virtual. If it, maybe right now, virtual. You wrote a book on virtual. How you can have how your business could thrive in a virtual atmosphere. You can give a training on that and then sell your book one to many. Now you tell the corporation in your speaking fees, go ahead and buy my book for your 2,000 or your 100 employees, and that's the way you're increasing your sales right there. But that's a salesperson that's talking to a pain that a business is having because you are a salesperson, and then you're solving that through a training, and then you're making your money through your book sale as well um, as, as one of the avenues of getting your name out there. The second thing that you can do in that strategy, once you have your pain and you know what that pain is, you got to get to where those individuals are camping out. So if my, my audience says it's not a corporation, it is the individual moms who are home and want to find a good cookbook, what I would do then is I would look for podcasts where those individuals are hanging out just like this. You can find it easy. You can go into Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or any of those directories, Spotify, and you can search and look for maybe like food-related podcasts. Reach out to those authors. Say you reach out to 10, and maybe you get four of them that's willing to have you on their show, now you're really break, you're really getting your message in front of those listeners, of those ideal listeners. And I think one thing that happens too, we talk about making sure those individuals, before you write your book, I'm sure you create a, an ICP or individual ideal customer profile or ideal reader pro- profile. That individual you're writing to, he or she camp out somewhere, figure out where their audience is, and then you can go towards it. So that's podcast, you can take advantage of that opportunity, and then, and I would make those pitches very, very simple. I would just reach out to the person writing. And again, the, the podcast host, they have pains themselves. You can say, Hey, you know, Joe, I listen to your podcast and I see that you help, you know, we serve the same community. One of the big challenges I find that they have is this. Do you feel your comfort, your audience would have a, uh, be, you feel your audience would be open to hearing something like this that can help them solve this pain? And, yeah, he's probably be like, okay, yeah, I'm looking for great guests. Um, don't mm-hmm. agree, braggadocious, just share that. And then you want to start the dialogue. And I think that's where some people get messed up sometimes when it comes to mm-hmm. doing their outreach. They think I need to convince somebody to do something. You don't convince people to do something. You convince people to convince themselves 
That's the convincing part. And when you can help somebody recognize you can solve a problem for them, they're going to act and they're going to own it. So understand your pain, understand your ideal customer, know where they hang out, and then from that you can create that outreach to help that. So those are two different ideas that you can take advantage of right away to help your book. And there's others, but I want to see if you have any questions with that, Judith. No, I, I think that that is ideal. And I'll, I'll tell you the other thing is if you can get the host, I'll, usually that's you're going to start off, by the way, with an email because a, a lot of podcasts, they contact us this way um, and push it through. If you can get in a actual verbal dialogue with the host, I'm telling you what they're going to pay attention to is your voice, how responsive you are. Uh, if, especially if you don't uh, interact in a what I call the the deposition model, yes, no, I don't recall. You <laughs> know, horrible, boring. They uh, most podcast hosts that I know of, and certainly the ones in my show, as well as when I have been a guest on other podcasts, is they want some fun, they want some interaction, they want some stories to support it, they want really how to tips of how you can do it. And, and here's a tip that I would add in, and this is from my years and years of speaking on the, the stage and platform, is that I always imagined that there were people who were blind in my audience, and my mm. words were going to have to paint a palette for them that I was going to have to really take them on the train ride with me so so they could see it and experience it as I was so that would be one of my tips no I and I love that one because the, the greatest part about it is that now you you have to you're being descriptive I I've learned one of my speaking coach my speaking coach uh, one she was the the only speaking coach, <laughs> but one of the things that she always used to, we always discussed was how we want to help the audience to use as many senses as possible when we're speaking. Mm-hmm. So in this All way that you're saying, yeah, because mm-hmm. if I can tell, I've, I've had situations, Judith, where somebody is explaining something and I'm like, man, I could taste that. <laughs> like they're talking Absolutely. about a strawberry and it's like you know, the red <laughs> plump strawberry, it's not too soft and it's just the right firm and it just smells so good. Can't you smell it? And you're like, yeah, I actually can. Like, taste it. When you take that first bite and the sweetness rushes down your throat, you're like, oh, yeah, I can taste the strawberry now. But you're helping the person to use more of their senses in that in that way. They're seeing you. They're hearing you. They're they're using their nose kind of and uh, bringing back something from the past. And and it's there's a power in it. So whenever you're doing that speaking, whenever you're speaking from the stage, you have to implore that. Look for ways that you can bring in more of those senses into it. But um, – Yes, it, but you will mm-hmm. be. A, I would be. You'd be amazed how many times you're when those people who are reaching out to us, they don't take advantage of mediums. I'll tell you the best pitch I've ever had where somebody was reaching out. This was an author as well, and uh, he was. He's a writer, um, not necessarily a book yet, but he was writing a lot of, uh, of publications and doing some stuff in the marketing world. So. This guy, one of the things, he made sure he focused on my pain and he focused on me when he reached out to me. And that was, it just kind of blew my mind. And I was, I was really excited to, to work with him. Another person, what they did was he, he did a audio. He knows I'm a podcaster. So what's better than to tell a podcaster you want to come on the show through audio? Makes sense. Novel idea. So he sent me an audio clip of that, a mini podcast, so to speak, talking about how he would like to come on my show. Um, or was it vice versa? And I think it was he wanted me to go on his show as well. I was blown away, and of course I said yes, and of course I replied back to him quickly, more than so than than the others. But he also knew my pain that I wanted to get my message out there to, for my community, and two, he also wanted to solve a pain that my community had, so he wanted to speak on a topic. So we swapped podcasts. It was fantastic, and he got a chance to get his stuff through way ahead of the line, um, more than anybody else. But th- mm-hmm. those are. But you, you got to have the pain. Without pain, there's no no gain at all. No, there's always. Unfortunately, there's always a little pain. But um, yeah. it's life. It is life on that. And that I, you know, I did a podcast with. Um, it was a uh, bookmarking, really marketing related tips, and mm-hmm. the host. Um, cause it, it was a straight shot. There weren't commercial breaks or anything. We got to the end. She said, do you have another half hour? Cause it was a half hour show. I said, I can make one for you. What do you need? She said, 
There is so much information here. I just want to do a double show and just redo it. Okay, so my style, and I think you all need to know what your style in your sailing, I love to share tips. I'm, I'm a really tip person. You know, ding, 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 ding. And um, and people like tips. So when I know I have a tip guest on, I often will say, all right, have, get your notes out because you're you're going to take them. You, you can listen to it again. You're still going to have to write down this stuff. Okay? So, all right. So let's just jump into that. So we've got a couple. We've got two minutes. Oh, my gosh. We've got another break coming. All right. So Where's the time that, flying? Tim's time's going. That, it always goes fast. In my experience is it always goes fast. So, so in the two minutes, um, what other sales strategy might we throw in here? I mean, I think podcasts are a great idea. Certainly, they who, where do they hang out? What's the pain? Is essential. You know that the uh, uh, actually it's it's the th- W's. Who are they? What's the pain? Where are they? Critical, everybody. Yeah, another- I think the next thing that you need to realize is that you need to become your own media company in the sense because whether that's your own podcast or just utilize social media, I mean, if I were, if I, if I was an author trying to publish my book for the first time, you best believe um, I'm going to do the podcast right, but I'm also going to go on, I'm going to utilize LinkedIn if that, because I would obviously probably focus on business there, right? Um, and then the second part is you would want to focus on your, your audience of uh, where to hang out. So for that, maybe YouTube, excuse me, not YouTube, um, Instagram or Facebook. And one of the strategies I saw that this author did was they were always present on social media. Uh, and I just was like blown away. And so once a week had a, a Facebook live answering questions relative to the topic, not pushing the book. The book was there. The book was, you know, it was uh, in, in, in the, the artwork, but they were still, Speaking to problems that their ideal in the readers had, and that made it powerful. They were always in my sight, always on my mind, mm. and then it prompted me to obviously go and check out their books and so forth. All right, so one other thing I'll add on, and we're going to then break, is make sure there's also traditional media. So what you all should be doing is finding the handles, easy peasy to do, post on Twitter. That's where they're going to hang out and post out that way. We'll be right back with Donald Kelly. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Discover the power of you and your book at the Judith Bryles Unplugged events. Each summer, Judith Bryles Book Marketing Unplugged unfolds over three intensive days working with just Judith. You get publishing strategies, author and book platforms, book marketing panache and pizzazz, and authoring tools to take you and your book to rock star success. In the fall and winter, Judith Bryles Speaking Unplugged includes Judith as your coach and mentor during two powerful days. You will learn how to structure a speech, how to create openings and closings, how to find gigs that pay you and sell your books, and you will get one-on-one coaching. Go to thebookshepherd.com and click on the Events tab to learn how to participate at the next Unplugged Workshop event. Congratulations on getting your book published. The effort you put into your work is truly commendable. But what's next? What will happen to all the knowledge you have worked so hard to acquire to produce your book? Here at Toginet Radio, we can provide you a platform to keep your knowledge working for you through the power of podcast. The subjects our podcasts cover are as varied as the grains of sand on a beach. From life coaching to military resources to business success, even to the paranormal. We have a place for everyone. To get started on your next step, call Scott at 903-787-5880 or email him at scott at toginetradio.com. That's S-C-O-T-T at T-O-G-I-N-E-T-R-A-D-I-O dot com.
Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Coming up, you'll hear more about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. You know, I, I do want to add to the last little bit because I, you know, am so tuned into doing so much media um, on the traditional side as well that I'm not kidding for all of you. Twitter is the place they hang out. Find out their at signs. It could be at CNN, at Fox News, at uh, your whatever, your ABC or your CBS or your, uh, uh, what's the other one? <laughs> the Peacock people, NBC uh, channels NBC. are... Yeah, NBC, plus the others, uh, that you know what those handles are for your local as well as your national. And then when you do postings out, whether it's LinkedIn, social media, whether you do Pinterest, Instagram, or whatever, you use those uh, in there so it will trail within their flow that whoever monitors their social media streams will see that something's coming up. And if you're using the right keywords, the right pain points for their audiences, don't be surprised that you might get a call. So just, mm-hmm. just saying that. All right. So you talk about mottos, Donald. So let, let's kiss on that a little bit. So uh, are, are we referring to slogos or slogans or taglines or is there something different here? Yeah, like your your own like your own motto, uh, right? Your, your own messaging. Like, what is it that you have? I think what happens with that slogan or with that message, like for instance, you know, Nike has "Just Do It." Um, it it's mm-hmm. inspiring mm-hmm. people to take advantage, take action. I think for each and every one of us, we need to have that motive or that motivational message that our audience can cling to. So let's say again, if I am a let's keep going with cookbook. You can, you know, maybe the model or the motivational message that my audience, when they hear that, it's like, you can cook well, you could cook right. <laughs> you know, what I mean, you, you could, or cook, you can cook healthy in 15 minutes or less. But it's something that I can use every time I'm, every time I'm speaking, every time I am out there. And it's like that, it's like music to the person, the ideal reader, readers here ears mm-hmm. because when they hear it they resonate and say yes that's me the other thing that i want to touch base on with it too judith is going back to that message is mm-hmm. your your message and the value that you have i know a lot of people especially when they're authors and i ask them tell me what your book's about and they're oh, like well yes. it's about this it's about this it's about I this know. And, you know and, and know. the dog and it's like well uh, um, did you just uh, that was like two minutes so what is the book about <laughs> i don't yeah. want to hear why you wrote the book uh, but one of the simplest ways, the, one of the easiest strategies that I've seen for sales reps and for anyone if they're trying to figure out their message, here's what I tell them. Give people a pain. I know I keep going back to this because it's so true, but then give them a solution. So let's say, for instance, if it's the cookbook, you know, somebody might say, well, Donald, tell me, what's your book about? I could say it's a cookbook, but then they're going to be like, oh, it's like a Betty Crocker cookbook. I would say something, you know, I'll be like, well, they'll say, Donald, what's your book about? Well, Judith, you know how that feeling when you get home from work on, you know, yep. Wednesday afternoon and you're just starving and you want something quick and easy and that's not going to raise your cholesterol? And then you're going to probably say, yeah, well, that's what we fix. That's what this book is about. It teaches you how to get some delicious right. meals in 15 minutes or less. Would you be open to take, checking out a copy on Amazon? Yep. Exactly. You know what I mean? or, uh, it, yep. I have a book called How to Create a Million Dollar Speech. So what is that a book about? <laughs> you know, you know, which I have done. So the, the, the book is about the, the pain is I've got this book. How am I going to sell them? Or, or, <laughs> or, or the pain is I don't know how to speak. Or the pain is I don't know how to sell myself to be hired as a speaker. It's going to come into that realm. So my message is I show people how to create a million-dollar speech based on your book. Or I show people how to create a million-dollar speaking career based on your expertise. That's what I do. Boom. You know, dealing with that. It's done. So – if you have a book or you have an expertise and you want to speak, this is for you. If you don't, screw it. But I, yeah, I think throw it away. You, not, not, get it out of your yeah. mind. It's not yours then. <laughs> yeah. 
But that's what you're talking about, getting it down so people, so you know. And it needs to roll off your tongue, listeners. This is something that needs to roll off your tongue. Uh, that you don't have to keep, what, what did I write down? What was my message that I want? No. <laughs> you, you, you know, it's got it. Like what you're, uh, Donald, when you're talking about cookbooks, I actually read cookbooks. I, I am a good cook. <laughs> I, I read cookbooks. So I am, I'm a good cook. I am always playing. I'm always experimenting with stuff and am going around with it. So if someone, you know, if I was that millennial you talked about at the opening of the program, it's easy peasy. Delicious meals um, in 15 minutes. Okay. Look at that. You know, and that's it. I show people how to create easy peasy, delicious meals in 15 minutes or less. Why don't even throw in something else? But that's all you need to do. And I think that they all complicate it. They make it too, yes. and you're right. They want to tell you the life history of where this book. No one gives a, a twiddly <laughs> dip. I don't care where you were a kid and the book came from and, no, no, no. and how your dog and your mom, no, no, no. What is it going to do for me? What problem are you solving for me? If you so could tell me about that, then bam. Yep. W- WFIM, what's in it for <laughs> <me>? <laughs> yes. You can tell Donald and I are both from sales backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Age to the men. So is is the author's motto different from the value message, uh, it, which is more of a pitch? Is is there a difference in in this arena? Yeah, I mean, I think you can have you can have different uh, you know different things that that tie back to it. I always like to focus on the uh, on the reader, right? Um, I like to focus on them and to to give them that that motto or that that message that's going to tie to again what's in it for those individuals, but you can have your own. Like for me, my personal, which goes back to my why. So especially the reason, another reason why your motto or this, this slogan, so to speak, can be of help is when you are having those dark moments and those dark days, why did I write this book? And maybe it is, I want to change every single, I want to change the way people live and eat um, for the better. And if that's the, you know, the motto or the motive that, that you're going to have, put that on your whiteboard, you put that on your mirror, but it's something that you can refer back to. It's going to give you the energy when you need to get out and you need to do those outreach, when you need to send those emails or connect with people on Twitter or do those podcast outreach to get on those shows because you need to evangelize this message. You have a mission. You want all these people to start changing the way that they're eating. You're tired of seeing people eat unhealthy and it's affecting their life and their well-being. If that's your message, if that's the model, then you make sure that model is personal and it goes back to your why. But your customers don't necessarily need to know that. They're, if there's a model or message for them, it's in that book, in, a, in the book message, simply saying, like, you know, eat better, live live better or whatever. But it, it's tied to their pain and it's tied to them coming back to you and um, recognizing you as that source of the uh, solution or answer to the problems that they're having. Am I making mm-hmm. sense of that? Yeah, it does. And you know that it just, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking when I'm working with clients with their titles for their books, um, yeah. that the shorter the title, the main title, always the better because it's more memorable, number one. And that title, which is a sales people, it's a sales yeah. uh, lighthouse. It's twirling around. That beacon is going around. The siren's going, come to me, come to me. <laughs> so, so, so you've got this thing going around. But it's the subtitle. We bring these things together that brings in either the motto or a part of the value. So the subtitle of a book title is the promise of what's between the covers. What are you going to deliver to solve their pain? So that pain has to be... The pain word has to be in that subtitle. Now I'm talking nonfiction. Fiction's a different animal, but yeah, just, just think about that. Too. So when you you go through, you, you should think sales. You've got to think about sales when you do your book titles. So <laughs> it's just amazing my two how bits. often. Go ahead, sorry, Judith. Just my two bits there. No, and I and I love that too bit, and I, and I was I just think it's amazing how much we are talking about the pain. It it just keeps reiterating over and over. 
I just I, I feel that sometimes when people get that fear of rejection, it's because they're thinking about themselves too much, and that's maybe what one of the the challenges. And I, I know I, I still mm. I'm not gonna lie. I'm telling you just straight up on broadcasting to uh, thousands of people. I do get the bubbles or the butterflies in my stomach when I'm making those outreach, and I've been doing this for years. So as I'm, I'm gonna say, do you get not get that? Of course not. However. Those bubbles aren't, or those uh, butterflies aren't like the way it used to be. I have more confidence in what I'm offering because I know that there's a value in what I'm bringing to somebody. But it doesn't; those butterflies don't hinder me. I learn to channel those ener- energy or channel that excitement, the the nervousness or worry into an excitement that this is something that I can help somebody with, and they're going to be excited after they hear about it. And if I can focus on them and focus on that problem, then I don't find myself getting too worried. It doesn't become deliberate. Uh, the it don't becomes to the point where it's destructive, where it's holding me back from advancing it and bringing that message to other people. So you, when it comes towards you having that fear of rejection, just usually it's because we are focusing on ourselves and not on the other person. That if you can adopt that and come to understand it. You're always, always, always going to be able to to sell because you're going to solve. So you're going to bring solve problems for people. And everybody, again, go back to the thing. People love to buy, but they hate to be sold. People want to get those solutions for problems that they have. And sometimes they don't even know they have a problem. And it's requisite that you help them recognize there is a problem because they probably just have put a band aid on it for years. Maybe for the cookbook scenario, I've just always just eaten, you know, spent money at Chipotle for the past several years and. That was what I. That was my my means of of getting good, quick, healthy meals. But if I, if you were to show me that that is not sustainable and it's not a good idea, but I can have a more meaningful experience with the cook, you know, with cooking 15 minutes or less, then I will be interested. You point out that the bandaid of Chipotle every day is 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 going to fall off, and I could have something else. Um, but and I call that the blind side challenge. Uh, the blind side challenge. Sometimes mm. people. You, if you watch football, fan of football, Judas. Yep, I am. But we have we have okay. 15 seconds here. We're going to take a little okay. break, so we we can come back with football. But I but I love. It's called the blind side challenge. Blind side challenge. Okay, so we're going to come back. We're going to kiss that, and then we're going to get <laughs> more into some of the fear factors, um, and the overwhelm. <laughs> This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. The book shepherding concept is simple. The publishing world is changing, and so must you. You need an experienced shepherd and guide to collaborate with you as you create, strategize, develop, publish, and achieve your publishing goals. Publishing is riddled with obstacles, sometimes nightmares for the author. You do not need more problems. You want solutions. Dr. Judith Riles will shepherd you through the maze and chaos. At times, she has had to step in and rescue a book. A book that has been sabotaged by a publisher, by a publishing service provider, and sometimes even by the author. If you want author and book success, connect with her today at thebookshepherd.com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book... If you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, we're in our final segment. Donald Kelly's with me. He's known as the Sales Evangelist, and his website is thesalesevangelist.com. So I'd encourage you to explore it, 
uh, check out his blog, certainly his podcast link, so you can learn more. If sales is what your bugaboo is, and you get stuck with it, you you have the, your heels, heels, and maybe your palms of your hands dug in, because you don't want people to think you're a salesperson. Get well. For, my line is get over it. But um, that that is really you have to get over that. You are a salesperson. And your book is the product you're selling. And it could be your expertise. It could be workshops you're doing. It could be webinars that you're doing. It could be an online course that you've put together. But you are the core. Your expertise is connected with it. So, Daniel, let's talk about the blind side factor. <laughs> yeah. So the blind side challenge here, let's, what happens with – with sales reps is usually well let's let's not even use the term sales rep let's just say you're 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 author or you're you're doing outreach trying to help somebody understand what you have to offer when it comes towards your um, with blindside challenges people sometimes recognize there is an issue but oftentimes they don't even know that they have that problem so go back to the cooking example we talked about you know the 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 pain is trying to get something good, good, delicious, and healthy. So what I thought is a good solution is to go to Chipotle every single day. The blind side challenge to that is that maybe they're obviously the cost and then also maybe the long-term longevity of my health, even though it's, you know, it's good food. It's just, you know, it's, it's not home cooked food and how that can help me, you know, emotionally cooking something for myself and the satisfaction. So when you point out to me something that I have not thought about, that is a blind side challenge. If you look in football, there's a the quarterback has a blind side. If I'm a right-handed quarterback where I throw my right right hand, the left side usually I probably don't pay attention too much to that, and that's why I have uh, uh, somebody protecting that blind side for me. In sales or with your prospect or with your authors, you want to give them that. You want to give them that clear. Blind side. You want to you want to give them that. Uh, excuse me. You have to give them that um, that clear protection or the identification of those things that could be a potential problem in their blind side, and then that way, when you can hear somebody say, "Ah, I've never thought about that," now you know you have them. Now you know that they're interested, and now you know they're going to be more than willing to move forward. I've never mm -hmm. thought about that. If you can get somebody mm -hmm. to say that. You're, 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 it's money. It's all done it, at that point. And that's terrific. And, and here's, for those of you who don't watch football or follow football, <laughs> I, I bet you drive a car. Your blind yeah. side is resolved by your rear view mirror and your two side mirrors. Okay. Yeah. So that, that, that's your, that's your assist. That's, that's, yeah. that's your, your wingman, so to speak. So, uh, I, I think that that's really important to recognize. So you could create everyone, you could put together pitches, you could do core batches, you, uh, messages, you could have things go around that would incorporate that kind of blind side, um, mm -hmm. area, you know, from, from as simple as contrary to popular belief. Most oh, yeah. people, you know, most people are blindsided by, and then what's the problem? And you know, your listener thinks, shoot, she's talking about me. Okay? <laughs> yeah, I had this one guy I brought on my show once, and he talked about uh, – he was talking about water. And I was like, what? He sells water. You know, like you know, some yeah. – they have soft water, uh, soft water machines or whatever. Yeah. And he said, um, Donald, do you drink uh, the tap water? And I was like, no. He's like, why not? He's like, because well, it doesn't taste good. It's not as good. He's like, okay. Um, and then he was like, uh, well, Donald um, – what if I told you that you drink, uh, you know, X amount of gallons of the, um, of, well, he went on, he went on and said, Donald, do you take showers? And I was like, yeah. And I'm like, what kind of, you're being facetious now. And he's like, no, I, of course I take showers. He's like, yeah, I know you do. He's like, um, but what if I told you when you take a shower, you're actually drinking X amount of gallons of water? And then he's like, did you know your skin is the biggest organ in your, on your body? And I was like, what? And it's like the same chemicals mm -hmm. that you're trying to keep out from drinking, that's actually seeping through. Blind side challenge. I mm -hmm. said, I never thought about that. <laughs> mm. That's when he knew he got something on me. That not necessarily got something on me. He taught me something I did not know. And that opens the door 
that's the where you want to be when you when it comes to a blindside challenge. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's kind of a fun thing to do. I might do that with some yeah. of my coaching coaching authors, <laughs> play with them. So you know, when yeah. they're dealing with their customer base, when they're talking with people, come up with things that would be a blindside challenge to them. I love that. Okay, yeah. so that goes on. All right, so let's kiss on some of these things that the reason why authors do have such a hard time selling their books. I mean, we've, one, dealt with the problem, you know, mm-hmm. where are they hanging, you know, um, you know, what is it exactly you're about? But what are some of the other play, things, maybe not players, components that come into play that, that set up for either mediocrity or failure? Yeah. I think the biggest one goes back to what you're sharing is that if I put it on Amazon, then I will, it will automatically, the, the field of dreams Ugh. lie. If you build it, they will come. If I just write the book, then that's big. If I get the book on Amazon, then I'm going to get reviews. And you have to have a strategy, and I'm sure you teach them this uh, with some of the strategies. I heard many authors use different strategies where they might have the price lowered early for a day or two and get a bunch of their friends, family. I mean, you sell the book before you even have the darn thing, and that's what I recommend to people with anything. Anything you do, you need to sell it before it's there. Um, so pre-sell. Not necessarily, you don't have to take the money, but you get those pre-orders. I, I would, I would like to get. And if I was in the authors, if you're in your shoe and you're launching your book, I would want to have, and maybe you have a different, you have a sweet number for this, this, but I would say you need to get at least that, you know, 102, you know, at least 100 people that are committed to give you their email address and say, yes, I'm interested, Donald, and I would be willing to, you know, purchase a book or get some kind of interest or, you know, go and review it when it goes live. That way you're having a base of customers already. Uh, people who are – those are the ones that are the easy ones. They know, like, know, like, and trust you and love you. And then you're, you're, you're first you're, – at least you're starting off with some excitement, and that helps you to, to launch with a good strategy. But if you're just going to create the book and go through the whole process and then sit back and then wait for it to come in, um, I, the, the cornfields are going to be empty, um, going back to Field of Dreams. You're not going to have those people. Well, there. <laughs> so let me let me tap in and add on to that. So I, I actually usually had three to four hundred books pre-sold before my book was before I had a book in hand, and and how I did it, I always had pre-flyers so people could sign up mm-hmm. and pay for it right then and there, knowing it was going to be shipped within six months. And I would give them a season. I never did in July of 2020. It would be in the summer of 2020 or the fall of 2020. That way, that's one way. Secondly. For all of you who are in the pre thing, I mean, I would suggest you do a flyer, put even a mock up cover, even a little border with the title of your book, but have a good, oh. a, a good blind, you know, the blind side type so you could address it. A par- short paragraphs, like a couple of lines of what's the problem? If you are this, here's the solution type thing. Or the, remember for fiction, it's the fantasy, what you're going to take him into what world. That's oh, easy peasy. Yeah. And you did, that's gold to collect it and you have it together. And also you'll have their email. The second thing I would do is always every, Everywhere you go, dear author, have a clipboard and either have your <laughs> name and photo or you have your book cover up there and you say at the very tippy top of it, you will be added to my preferred email list. Okay. That's what I call the first opt in. And then you get their name in that and you could have another column. You know, if you, if you did a book and you've got it priced, you know, would you like it to Order the book, so be notified when the book is available. All right, that's what you can do. And if you start collecting that and build up your database, this is core infrastructure stuff that will build up. That's called marketing, but will be executed to sales, which I like. Oh, yes, it will. And I, I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. I love that idea. Love it, love it, love it. Well, I'll share it with you. There you go. You got it. <laughs> All right. So that uh, what about um, – so I guess we would put the field of dream into the area that they've just got the wrong mindset, would you say? Yeah. Is that – they're going down the wrong path yeah. on that. Yeah, it's, it's the wrong path. Of, uh, it, it's not just – it's kind of like sending your kids to school and saying that my kid is going to learn. It, the kids don't – just learn at school. They learn majority at home um, and when the parent follow up and take control of the learning. And that's the same concept. 
Um, don't beg for um, the, the Amazon to sell it for you. Take ownership. Get rid of the mindset. Know that if you don't do it, it won't sell. And if you no, can have that, money. Amazon, Amazon is not going to sell it for you. Amazon is a portal. <laughs> You're going to sell it, people. All right. So, rejection. How, rejection, how do you yeah. deal with rejection? Yeah, I feel that rejection is going to happen. And you could change the belief of it. You can see it as they're rejecting you as an individual, which is the wrong thing. Or you can see them rejecting the opportunity that they're not too sure they need right now. So a good example is I might say, tell you, you know, you call me and say, Donald, uh, I want you to or send me an email. I want to t- tell you about my book, blah, 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 blah. Hey, you know, I'm not interested right now. I don't much know about the book to say I'm not interested. It's just the fact that I'm busy doing a podcast interview. So that's more important to me right now. I can get back to you later. I'm not rejecting Judas. I'm not rejecting Pam. I'm not rejecting David. I'm rejecting somebody who is inviting me to do something that I don't see the importance of right now. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And sometimes people take rejection so personal they don't like me, and they wrote, I wrote this book, and nowadays they're saying that they don't like the book. They didn't say anything about not liking the book. They didn't say anything about not liking you. They didn't even want to respond to you in the first place. It's just because they have other things that are more pressing. You weren't compelling enough. You didn't give them enough value. It wasn't a blindside challenge. So, and it's not even saying that's forever. It's just not right now. Maybe I'll try it two weeks. Maybe I'll try it a month a different way, and that way I can get through, and they'll be in a more open plane and an open state to receive that. So not rejecting yeah. you, it may be just yeah. rejecting the, uh, the person. Oh, the, I mean, the, so the, 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 the get, act. Get zooks, get zooks. We're literally out of time, Donald. I mean, I could, <laughs> I could go on with you. So that means um, this is not a rejection. I'd like to have you back. <laughs> and so we can... We can, we can play for another hour. Um, but really there, there's so much more to get into. How do you not, don't appear pushy? And, um, and what if you think you're just a totally incompetent on selling? So what we should do is plan another show, uh, later on that we can really get into that. So we can have all these little nuggets that you've shared with our listeners. So thank you so much for being with us today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for being a part of Your Guide to Book Publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Each week.